Okay. <clears throat> I think we will wait maybe one minute or so. I think we have um wait for El Elizabeth and uh, for Rishi. But if given them about a minute or so, if not, we'll just get the show on the road. I have a question, guys. How, lo how long is the session, do you know? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. So we get more time each, so it's okay. So I guess it's a fair deal. Uh, so... <laughs> Okay, let's get the show on the road. If they show up, they show up. If not, we continue. Uh, I guess uh, good uh, morning for some, good afternoon and good evening for others, depending on which time zone um, you are. Uh, my name is uh, George Sebastiao, um, co-founder and CEO of a global blockchain organization, uh, Portuguese, Canadian, and I guess modern Vasco da Gama traveling throughout the world, Middle East um, and Africa for the last uh, almost 25 years plus. Uh, today we have an esteemed guest panelists um, in which um, the topic is going to be fintech, money transfer needs a new global infrastructure. Uh, I'm actually supposed to be one of the speakers, unfortunately Michaela um, has come down with COVID so she lost a part of her voice so i'll be replacing her as a moderator as well and and i'll contribute to the panel uh, i think two other members will be with us uh, shortly but we'll get the show on the road the topic of the panel is the global transfer of money requires speed as well as security uh, which is the service by a global banking network uh, we have new entrants which are disrupting or providing a better service especially to developing nations as you know in africa we have things like banking for the unbanked which is quite an important thing so how are we able to guarantee cash transfers outside of this traditional infrastructure or how can we modernize and get it scaled up enough so for this panel we have uh, and esteemed guests, including Rishi Mehra, Elizabeth Rossiello, Arak Ben Hezer, and Te Eljula. El 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 Hopefully, I said it correctly. So, um, I will maybe start with Te, uh, since he's got the best t shirt in the house. Uh, I think each of the panelists can spend a few minutes maybe introducing themselves and then also at the same time addressing the key projects that relate to this topic of fintech and then how they view the challenges and how they perceive these challenges uh, to be uh, addressed. And then from there, we go on to Barak. Hey, floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, as we said, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm based uh, today in uh, Dubai. It is uh, early in the morning, 1 a.m., so... Good morning. Um, I live in the Netherlands, uh, in The Hague. Originally, I'm Syrian. I'm born in Kuwait. I lived in Lebanon, and I migrated to the Netherlands in 2011. Uh, in 2014, I ended up in the refugee camps of uh, Holland, since my father is Syrian. And in order to stay in the Netherlands, I had to apply for asylum after my work contract got expired. And there in the refugee camps, we used Bitcoin, as you can see on my T-shirt, to live a life where we can order pizza, we can order cigarettes, we can order drinks. And it was all paid by Bitcoin. No need for an identity. We didn't have IDs in the camp. So this technology helped us to connect to the largest economy on earth, to the most visited place on earth, which is the internet. Uh, from there, I started advocating for the use of blockchain and specifically cryptocurrencies for financial inclusion. 
I worked as well in the identity space and the self-sovereign identity as a founding member of the sovereign network through my previous startup, which I founded, Titan.tech. And I had the chance to work with many nonprofit organizations like the Dutch Red Cross, World Food Program, and uh, many more. In my opinion today, what we're seeing around the world from refugee crisis in uh, Ukraine, in Syria, in Yemen, the need for technology has been never uh, needed uh, as today. And happy to uh, discuss whether we do need an identity in the fintech space to bridge financial inclusion, or can we do it really with crypto like Bitcoin? Well, from there, we go to Barak. Welcome. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for hosting me here. Um, I'm uh, Barak Benezer. I'm based in uh, Israel uh, or Marshall Islands, depending on when, when you catch me. And uh, I've actually been active in the remittance space for a while. Um, my previous company is called Nima. It has an app that helps uh, migrant workers send money. Uh, it's um, now basically owned by the biggest insurance company in Israel and the biggest bank in Israel. They just raised uh, 55 million shekels. Last year, they uh, transferred more than a billion shekels, and it's growing very fast. And then the, the second company that started is called um, SFB Technologies, and we're doing projects in the Marshall Islands, including the sovereign currency, which is the world's first uh, crypto legal tender. They passed a law that to create the legal tender. They didn't have their own currency before. They're using dollar. So now they're going to have their own currency called the sovereign. It's going to be completely uh, crypto-based uh, with algorithmic money supply. Um, and also um, uh, promoting a special economic zone now for crypto in the Marshall Islands. And they just uh, also passed the legislation for uh, the first legislation in the world to create, a, to be able to incorporate a DAO and have a limited liability, which is very important. Because uh, a lot of people today don't know that, uh, um, yes, it's a DAO, but if somebody sues the DAO, there's no limited liability. They can actually sue and, and take all your assets. So um, uh, being able to incorporate a DAO as a limited liability, uh, um, not-for-profit corporation is very important. And the Martian just passed the first legislation to do that in the world. So very excited to basically work with the Marshall Island to make them the most hospitable jurisdiction in the world for crypto activity. And I'm here at your service if you have any questions. Okay, this looks a very interesting panel. Uh, myself, apart from uh, having creating the global blockchain organization jointly with um, um, out of Oslo, one of the key elements is being the implementation of uh, blockchain in crypto and various projects. So we have undertaken several projects uh, that have been trying to do inclusivity of crypto and blockchain across Middle East and Africa. One of them is by the name of Ubuntu, which is using um, basically asset-backed uh, tokens. In this case, Ubuntu is using gold. And the idea is to create um, kind of a currency backed by gold so that then um, the money that is earned by the workers across over 50 countries don't get devaluated and it gets converted back to the um, original currency as needed and as it gets spent. It. And then we have a second one named um, Oris, which is using also asset backed. In this case, not gold, but uh, other metals, diamonds, uh, equivalent. So it's basically asset backed. But in this difference is that it is creating a, a stable currency um, uh, that is pegged to the dollar, so known as VX dollar. Um, I think both models have got pros and cons. Uh, you know, when you have something packed to, I guess today what you can consider the international currency of trade, but I think it's being challenged across the world. On the other side, you have obviously Bitcoin that is, um, I guess, not packed to, to anything and fluctuates um, along with the transaction fees and performance. But I think a lot of work is being done on the Lightning Network to speed up and being able to deliver high speed transactions. And I think the El Salvador has been 
a good test ground for that, allowing you to send even things like tips or Twitter and all that, so micro payments. Um, along with this, obviously, there's many cross functions that although not necessarily discussed in this project, I've participated so far in about three DeFi projects. So I consider both FinTech and DeFi kind of disruptive approaches to the, the traditional banking system that enable much lower cost um, transactions on one side, but also the capability to have a much more inclusive approach. I think between the two camps of, uh, I guess, no KYC, no identity and full KYC and full seizability of the assets, I think the the balance probably lies somewhere in between um, to achieve a proper balance. Um, I would like maybe to go back uh, and uh, get Tay to discuss how he sees this project in terms of inclusivity. I did heard previously, obviously, the distribution of funds across the refugee camps as uh, being touted across the community in the Middle East. I've been across Middle East and Africa for the last uh, 25 years. So I get to experience on the ground about 35 African countries, the entire wide Middle East, and a little bit of Asia from time to time as well. So back to Hey, I'm not capable of hearing you, so I'm not sure if it's a function of the platform or it's from my side. Barak, can you hear Tay? So we're having a bit of technical challenges. I can hear your speech, and obviously you're not mute, but I, I nothing is coming out of the sound at all. I can hear, I think maybe it's from Barak. Barak, can you hear Tay speak? Yeah, I can. Now, Tay, can you speak, please? No, I cannot hear you. Okay, we cannot hear you, Tay. So you're gonna have to maybe refresh the browser, or that—that's what I've tried. So let's go back to technology 101. Control Alt Delete. We apologize for the minor technical difficulties, but we get back to Tay in a few seconds. Okay, I think you're back. Tay, can you speak? Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. So continue. Sorry to, for the interruption. It's all yours. So what I was what I was mentioning is uh, Lebanon is a really live use case today on crypto uh, and health.
Yeah, I cannot hear you. No, no. The, your voice is is gone again. So I think you have to maybe switch to wired microphones or something. I think this platform maybe needs a bit of. I've had this trouble in previous browser-based platforms. Sometimes a bit tricky. Okay, let's try again. Hey, please go ahead. One more time. So uh, the, the the case of uh, of Lebanon when the banks failed and the currency went like into a huge spike of inflation. It was a really good use case for people in Lebanon to realize that, you know, crypto is a solution. But the challenge was with the identity. As a Lebanese person with a Lebanese passport, you're not able really to access crypto exchanges like Coinbase, like Binance, uh, like Kraken. Why? Because... Lebanon is not on a sanctions list yet, but it is what we call on a gray list. And countries like USA and Europe, they do not like to work with Lebanese banks and Lebanese financial institutions, and they do not accept Lebanese IDs as a, as a matter of know your customer or KYC, citing um, reasons for anti-money laundering, and counter-finance terrorism. So this put people in a corner on how can we tackle this issue. And this is where non-custodial wallets came to help. This is where VPN uh, came to help. And people started uh, using non-verified accounts at Binance and using non-custodial wallets to bypass this regulation enforced on People who do not have nothing to do with terrorism or with politics, they're just normal citizens and they need to, uh, you know, access finance through cryptocurrencies. Now, the question is, OK, Tay, how do you know that this person is not a terrorist? Well, social KYC, social proofs, connection with the diaspora really helps in this case. So our solution for that problem was when I'm sending money from, let's say, Brazil, which hosts 7 million Lebanese people in it. And I'm sending money from Brazil as a Lebanese diaspora to Lebanon, to my sister, brother, mother, father. There is some sort of connection between those two. And me, as a sender of money, I can connect to the receiver. And I can vouch for the receiver. Now, this connection is what we need to prove that this person is not doing something bad. And if they do something bad, we can point out to the origin of the funds or where did they come from. So that system can help, you know, if we take the US dollar, if we take the local currency out and we put crypto instead, this system can help bridge finance, remittances. It can help get people into crypto, turn their local currencies into crypto, and then turn their crypto back into local currencies. And suddenly you're operating on a financial network that is open, neutral, decentralized, borderless, and immutable. So leveraging the concepts of what we call self-sovereign identity and leveraging the concepts of uh, crypto, we are able to create this new type of finance. So in our solution, we... Uh, we call our platform uh, Flus. Flus in Arabic means money. We have Flus agents. Those agents are KYC and they extend their services to non KYC people. Today, what happened in Canada as well is a big uh, lesson for crypto users not to trust centralized exchanges with their money when the Canadian Prime Minister ordered to freeze the assets of protesters at the Canadian borders, they were not able to seize the assets of non of holders of crypto and non-custodial wallets. So the world is going crazy. What's happening in Ukraine, in Yemen, uh, in Lebanon, in Canada, it doesn't matter anymore if you are 
developed, underdeveloped, third world country, first world country. The mix between politics and money uh, has been always intertwined for ages. And now what crypto is coming to say, we are separating the state from money and we're bringing in a new era of finance to people that is similar to the way we communicate today. I'm talking to everyone around the world through my camera and laptop. And in the near future, I'm able to transact with everyone around the world through my smartphone and a QR code. Amazing and um, interesting. Obviously, there are still some challenges other than identity that need to be solved. I mean, I do remember one being the fact that sometimes transactions need to be potentially reversed on the blockchain. And since some of them are not reversible, there has been some solutions that have come out of Israel. And the name is not so important, but it's kind of, the, they call it the undo button for Bitcoin transactions. And it um, provides, I guess, ad additional features into the ecosystem to provide a complete end-to-end -end solution. But back to Barak to also give his, I like his um, approach towards uh, DAO because I think DAO, although still not very scalable, but I think is on the right direction to create a whole new uh, generation of inclusivity and the creation of this new blockchain and crypto economy. So. Yeah. Back, back to you. Go ahead. What, what is the question? Sorry. Actually, there is no question here. The question was more your discussion and continuation on the point of view of you know, including the inclusivity of uh, non-banked individuals and in payment systems. And more specifically, since you had addressed the issue of DAO, how, for example, DAO would contribute to actually this paradigm as well. Yeah, I think that DAOs are essential, um, you know, because uh, time and again, we see that it's very hard to trust the centralized systems, right? And um, when a lot of people are now, most of the DeFi ecosystem operates with DAOs, you know, uh, but the people who operate those DAOs are actually, um, the people who founded them um, are actually now legally exposed to class uh, legal actions, to any type of uh, legal action, because um, there's no limit liability over there. And the new legislation in the Marshall Islands enables to create, uh, to register a DAO in the Marshall Islands as a, li as a limited liability, uh, not-for-profit corporation. And therefore, the people who started DAOs have a legal protection against uh, lawsuits um, uh, and so I think it's pretty uh, groundbreaking. This is only a, a first step in a, a series of legislations that are expected to come out of the Marshall Islands that we are working on. Uh, so I expect to see many, many more such uh, pleasant surprises. So the, basically what the Marshall Islands, to try to maybe for the audience, they have gone beyond what the, uh, Wyoming has done in the U.S. to enable extra protection or extra identity within the legislation itself. Uh, yeah, Marshall yeah. Islands use a British kind of system or British-based system for banking. They're, they're allowing you to register a limited liability corporation. And moreover, their their currency is going to be digital. So um, as you don't, you wouldn't need to have all this like off-ramp, like, like as, as my friend Tay is, is basically describing, a lot of the challenge today with crypto is not crypto itself, but the on-ramp and the off-ramp from crypto. And this is where the problem arises. So um, Marshall Islands, actually, now they're going to launch their legal tender, a new legal tender that's going to be only digital. And so uh, there's not going to be any more the question of on-ramp and off-ramp because everybody's going to be on the blockchain. So I actually believe that it's only a matter of time before more and more of the monetary system will move onto the blockchain because the world is going into um, a period of high instability. And instability shows you that it's very hard to trust the central organizations, the governments, the banks. 
And um, you see what's going on now in Ukraine. There's no telling where it's going to go. Um, and so I believe that when we're going to see more and more inflation, more and more hyperinflation in countries, more and more um, run on the banks and crashing of financial institutions, and more and more people would actually do all their business only on the blockchain. And so uh, now it's a problem, the on-ramp on the off-ramp. But I think in the near future, uh, more and more of the global GDP is going to flow into into blockchain and never come back into the fiat economy. No, no, I, I believe that, you know, the entire economy eventually will be on some form of blockchain. Um, I do believe the counteraction to that has been CBDCs, but there have been a very big backlash, or at least um, uh, people have been very misappro- uh, you know, fearful of CBDCs as a way to um, have a much bigger control over their lives to the point of either seizing the funds or understanding where these funds are being used on a day-to-day basis. So, so people want to have a certain amount of, of um, anonymity on their transactions or at least the freedom of how to spend their money without being either so controlled or, or so watched. Um, what the area of um, KYC, I think um, when we looked at, Tay, you mentioned a social-based KYC, which is kind of um, almost like a non-regulated KYC. It's a self-regulated KYC. Have you seen any um, um, countries have like, have accepted that, or it's purely today just a honor-based system from the um, decentralized exchanges that are actually supporting it? Uh, if you're asking me, I, I would I would say it is more than an honor-based system. I mean, NGOs, they use social KYCs. Uh, why would we accept that Red Cross verifies and validates the people they, they, they can help while we can't do that? Um, you know, living in refugee camps have, have taught me a lot about identities and about, you know, how identities can be faked. And there is no one... Uh, ruler that fits everything or all the measures. Um, regulators, they live in their yeah, ivory, ivory towers and they put the rules, but they're not on the ground. Today, even on exchanges like Binance, I can buy a passport from the dark web and I can create as many IDs as I want and I can do proper KYCs on many exchanges as I want. But the relationships that we're having with each other, this, you cannot fake a relationship. I cannot fake a relationship between me and my sister, between me and my mom, especially if it is a repetitive transaction that I do every single month. Uh, I cannot perhaps fake a relationship between my brother and his university and the university and the government and then me and my brother. So this social chain of identity can be used and leveraged in today's digital world. Today, which is more important? My Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter ID, or my driving license? And the answer is no. My social media ID in today's context and economy is much more powerful than my driving license. Although my driving I license, have designed, a although my driving license is designed to prove to the policeman that I can drive, yet we don't use it in that way. We use it to get into clubs, to prove that we're above eighteen, to buy alcohol. So why can't we replicate this physical identity into the digital space? But the point is, today we have a technology that is working since 2010, that does not require an identity. When I was in the camps, I downloaded the wallet, I had some Bitcoins on it, and I transacted without showing my ID at all. Yes, there is risk for misusing it, 
there is risk of committing fraud, of committing illegal activity, but that we should not punish 3 billion people and exclude them from financial systems just because a few of us are doing bad things, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, with this tech. So uh, it is time to look beyond the regulation. It is time as well for the regulator to think out inclusive systems and not, you know, build small isolated databases and isolated lists to satisfy a, a you know, to satisfy a few, a, a group of few people. I have had the chance to visit over 35 countries in Africa and I've seen the challenges of creating banking systems for the, what we sometimes call the unbanked and uh, obviously the traditional KYC mechanisms of address are simply not working or not enough. So you need to provide a much more inclusive system so that these people are brought into a, a proper system where the thing they want to do is just um, earn a living. They want to be able to yes. pay for the services exactly. that they use every day. It could be a taxi, could be education. Um, exactly. And everything else. You can limit, you can limit the, the transaction. So you can say, well, in this wallet, you can max transact up to $1,000 without KYC or $10,000 without KYC. You can use biometrics. You can use uh, face technologies. You can use palm technologies. There is a lot of innovation, especially coming out from Israel, where it's a hub for these type of disruptive innovations and link it to crypto and then create this access for everyone. And don't punish people based on their race, based on their geography, based, the, based on their uh, ethnicity, just to satisfy a certain law or a certain, a certain rule. And you know, at the end, who's doing these bad things uh, are the banks. We all are reading what's happening in the news with uh, Credit Suisse. 15,000 criminals are using the bank. I mean, even in Switzerland, we're seeing a lot of, uh, fit, like, fishy activity in, in those legacy legacy banks. Back to Barak. Um, we looked at the DAO from your side. What about from the technology side? What do you consider to be the key important innovations to help include uh, these unbanked and these uh, new fintech solutions to, to bring them to the largest user community worldwide? What do you consider to be the challenges that need to be addressed? Yeah, I think that um, Tay um, is saying uh, very smart things. I think that today um, we basically discriminate people based on the country that they're coming from. And because if you come from a country that is not stable, such as uh, Syria or Lebanon, then you are going to be denied access because they're going to say, okay, there's a high risk of, 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 uh, of uh, counter-terrorist uh, financing, CTF, right? But the, the people in those countries, not the non-terrorists, are the ones that really need the, 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 the access, the Bitcoin, the refugees, right? They're actually, they need access because the terrorists in those countries made those countries unstable and also True. the superpowers, but that's another discussion, right? And so... Those people are now blocked, banned. Uh, and so I think that technology that will um, create some sort of like a risk assessment score for an individual and an identity for an individual, not based on their um, country of residence, would be uh, um, a, key, a key into solving a lot of those issues. Perhaps some sort of like a social score Perhaps some something that, as you you know you you like a credit score in your credit card that you operate in the beginning, you have um, maybe low limits, and then as you transact and 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 the system kind of like learns your social graph, it's able to grant you like higher privileges, um, and so, something like that that would be uh, not for just one exchange but like universally accepted. So I think some sort of like a KYC 
risk management, money laundering, uh, money, anti-money laundering, uh, CTF management solution that looks at in the, in the individual and not at their country is key. And today we have the technology for that. We have, um, we have you know, a lot of AI, machine learning. People have so much data where you can basically say what is their risk profile and, and, and give them access. And in fact, in fact, this technology is being used today by companies such as PayPal. They bought an Israeli company that gives them um, a risk profile on people before they even transact, before they buy, before they sell. So the same technology that gives a risk profile on a person um, before they transact uh, based on their credit could be used to, to, to create a risk profile uh, based on AML and CTF considerations. No, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, I remember when I first came to the Middle East um, 25 years ago, one of the organizations that had the best um, credit score in Saudi Arabia was actually a car company uh, and a, a retail company. It was Abdul Latif Jamil. And why? Because they knew the behavior of the customers much better than the banks did. Uh, and they were actually the distributor of Toyota, which at the time was the most popular country in, uh, car in the country. And, and in reality, it was the behavior that people had in terms of payments towards car loans and others, um, uh, you know, electronic devices that gave them this power. And, uh, you know, they, at some stage, they tried to create a credit score a company called El Jesser, but I guess the um, central bank kind of did not allow it to get through. But it really proves that today with big data and the access to the right technology, bring together a much better score for inclusivity would be quite an interesting solution to, to see BERT. Because obviously um, exchanges, uh, maybe with the exception of decentralized exchanges, like PancakeSwap, Uniswap, um, et cetera, which have zero KYC. Um, the other ones, you know, have to, they're controlled by the, the regulators or otherwise they get kicked out of where they operate. I think we saw Binance being kicked out of places like Singapore more recently. And so they've been trying to look for some homes in places like Bahrain and Dubai that I think have welcomed them a little bit more with open arms. Um, what I would like to do is maybe uh, uh, give each of uh, our two colleagues we have here, Tay and Barak, maybe some closing arguments. Uh, I think the other uh, speakers did not make it, maybe challenges with the platform. So, uh, and like this, we will close on time uh, by midnight, my time, I guess, probably two o'clock in the morning in Dubai. I think Israel, today I'm in Cyprus, so it must be a very similar time. It must be midnight by your side. So, Dave, any kind of words of wisdom or closing remarks as we build these new inclusivity financial solutions based through, on, um, both on technology will, but will, also on the social aspect, driving space? True. True. I would uh, say... Take in consideration the user experience and understand how the local environments, the local context of any solution that we are providing, whether it's crypto related or not, always put the user, you know, in the spot and design something that works for them. Do not discriminate against their race, their origin, their skin color. Uh, their first name, last names, dates of birth. And today we are in this digital economy. The largest economy on earth is the internet. The most visited place on earth is the internet. COVID has proven for us that if we are going to be resilient, we have to push for resilient solutions, similar to how we communicate on the internet in an open, borderless neutral and decentralized manner, we can transact on the internet in this uh, same manner. Uh, Barak, any final words of wisdom? <laughs> Marshall Highlands. <laughs> yeah, I, I just really... Listen, I, I, I really pray for global peace right now. <laughs> what can I tell you? Because, uh, you know, as you're reading the newspapers, it's just like, it's, it's disgusting what's going on, you know. 
our 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 our, our world is led by by psychopaths. You know, these these are the people that lead the world today. So when you can't trust people, uh, you got you, you end up trusting the machines, right? Um, and I, and I think that the the unfortunate situation right now, or maybe the fortunate is that most people, at least in our space, they'd rather trust an algorithm than they trust a human leader, right? Uh, and 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 um, I think that uh, what Tay is describing all those challenges is really heartbreaking. Where people really need to have access and they cannot and and I uh, think that um, there's so many startup companies in the world and I, I it's hard for me to see a space that is more important for innovation than this space um, the on ramp and off ramp for um, uh, for for blockchain, and so I, I just hope that more and more um, visionaries and, and entrepreneurs will join the space and, and come help uh, bring a better reality for the people here in the world. Amen. Thank you very much. It's been amazing. Uh, my final words of wisdom is: Don't forget who is this is for, which is the user. I think the best fintech solutions have come out of necessity, um, and I remember when mobile money give birth before blockchain and it was being used across Africa, across Africa where people are still figuring out around the world how to even develop such things, which means that with your mobile balance, you're actually able to pay a taxi and the person that collected that mobile money at the end of the day would go to a shop and get real money converted from that mobile credit. So the point is um, sometimes the simpler interfaces and the focus on the user and what is the needs of this user and the usage of uh, financial systems. Uh, I think a second example that I, I would like to give, which I think is very important from my travels, has been in the area of what I, I call inclusive or microfinance. Across these countries, I've seen uh, when you loan small businesses, most of the times even women businesses, $100, it can be uh, between a situation of life and death for that business. And that business is what is actually supporting the, um, those families. Uh, there's an interesting project that was done out of Pakistan, Kolakawat, that started with this $100 and now manages over $700 million in microloans. And interestingly enough, the key element is that 99.9% .9 of those loans actually get repaid back. What, what it really means is when you're actually helping people that need help, uh, those people are honest enough to return the money because it really made a difference in their lives. And I think when you combine this with the transparency and decentralization of blockchain, I think we have um, a new world operating system. Uh, and I think maybe this is also a good way to potentially replace politicians in the future. But I think we're still far away from that. So, but I think maybe one day that will come. So let's start by fixing first the financial systems and then I think eventually the politicians will get fixed as well over time. So hopefully. Amen uh, as well. I, so I uh, thank you very much for the time that we spent together and pleasure to meet you both online and thank you for the audience that is with us today. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and grabbing a coffee sometime in the future as well. Or a tea. Thank you very much for moderating. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everybody. Peace. Thank Say you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Peace.